Hey guys, welcome back to the Med Boys podcast. My name is Naman and I'm joined here by my co-hosts, Arushal and Nimit, and we have a special guest, guest today, Dr. Naki Jamo. He's a well-known dentist that has served communities around the world. He's volunteered and gone to brigades across Central and South America. How are you doing today, Dr. Jamal? Oh, I'm wicked. Super pumped to be here with you three fellas and uh, excited to talk about some dentistry, some volunteering and uh, excited to meet you guys. You guys are the future of, you know, dentistry and medicine. So this is, this is exciting for me too. Thank you for all those kind words, doctor. Um, just to start off, we'd like to, um, to t- ask you to tell us what you do on a daily basis and anything you'd like our viewers to know just before we start off into the main questions. Um, on a daily basis, I mainly, uh, sedate patients. Uh, so I'm a dentist and, uh, I'm a super, super proud general dentist. And, um, I mainly see, uh, anxious patients and I sedate them and do all their dental work. So I do a lot of, uh, third molars and I teach third molar extractions or wisdom teeth, um, across the country. And so, uh, that's the majority of my day. Like usually, um, I'll sedate anywhere from, you know, seven to 10 patients a day. Uh, do whatever dental work they need. And then in the evenings, um, I teach uh, other dentists, um, you know, how to, how to take out wisdom teeth online, like through Zoom, and, and I have my own, uh, you know, teaching platform. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty busy these days, but not busy enough that I can't carve out time for this. This is awesome. Well, yeah, on, like, honestly, that's, that's really impressive. The fact that you're able to uh, teach so many people over Zoom. I know that the struggles of having to teach uh, kids over Zoom uh, because I, I also um, teach at Kumon. So I understand. Whoa, that you went to, Ku- you're, you teach Kumon? Yeah. Well, uh, yes. I'm- yeah, as well. What? Man, I took Kumon when I was a kid. I tell everyone, I'm like, you guys have to put your kids in Kumon. Hey, man, maybe that's like, you know, the uh, first generation immigrant way of life. You know what I mean? It's like, man, you put your kids, make them good at math and English. And I remember when I was in like grade four, my dad got called into the school because Kumon teaches you to do math in your head. You never show your work. Is it still like that? It yeah. Is. And, yeah. Yeah. Right. And my teacher accused me of cheating over and over again. She thought I was bringing in a calculator into class, but I was like, man, I was a math whiz. I was like 427 times 63. Boom. I can't do that anymore, but I, I used to be really good at it. <laughs> so I'm sure, that, I think that's awesome. Kumon, <laughs> wicked, good job. Yeah, Kumon definitely has its benefits. And of yeah. course, since everything's on Zoom, I'm just like, you know, it's uh, it's definitely a hard time. Yeah. But yeah, honestly, I, I was going to ask you more about uh, the, the, the course that you're teaching, the Molar Essentials course. Could you talk a little bit about that course? Yeah, so it's called uh, Third Molars Online. And um, it, it's been, it took me three years to make. And it's all about um, creating the most comprehensive course for wisdom tooth extractions. And I found, especially for me, I wish I had something like that when I was, you know, learning to take out teeth because they don't teach you this stuff in school. And so a lot of dentists are scared and they, and they get frustrated um, when, you know, an extraction doesn't go their way. So I wanted to take the fear and frustration out of the whole situation and give other dentists, my, my fellow dentists confidence to take on third molars um, and, you know, which ones to take on, which ones to refer out. And I just want to create other successful dentists. And so that was like, you know, it's been a passion project for me and, and I've had so much fun uh, doing that. So it's been great. That's very kind of you. Um, I guess that ties us to the next question, which was, what was actually your motivation behind? So we, we know that you've volunteered a lot uh, and you're still volunteering and uh, you're helping a lot of people, but w- what is your actual motivation behind uh, taking the extra mile and, and helping these many people? Um, you know, it's all about mindset. And it took me a long time to figure this out. Like when I was an undergrad, like in your guys' shoes, all I really cared about was, you know, grades. And I was broke. And so I had a part-time job and, and all I really cared about was grades and studying. And, and I was pretty unhappy. Like I didn't enjoy my undergrad at all because I was so focused on, you know, getting somewhere. And I, I understand your guys is, I don't know if you guys felt the same frustration I feel. It's like, when, when do I get there? How am I going to know like when I'm there and when is that acceptance letter going to come? Do you know what I mean? And it's, it, it consumes you and it's so unhealthy. And so, um, as I got into, you know, dental school and everything, that same drive was still there. It was like, you know, 
what if I'm not good enough to be here? Imposter syndrome kicks in and you're just so unhappy all the time because you feel so insecure. But what really changed, and it changed for me, you know, a couple of years ago, even as a dentist, you feel the same thing, but it, it almost became a change in my mindset, a shift in mindset away from self and into service. And I found if we can provide service to the people around us, um, I, I know you're across the country, but if I can help you and I don't expect anything in return, to me, that fills my cup. And if anyone out there listening is stuck in a rut, I encourage you switch your mindset from self, you know, why, what am I doing wrong? What if I don't get this grade? What if this happens? What if that doesn't happen? What if you switch your mindset to how can I help that person? Or what can I do for these people here that I can help them? And I can, it's the, the surefire guaranteed way to make you happy and to create a sense of, of wellness and, and clarity. Like, I can't, I can't even explain. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think we know exactly what you're talking about. Like we literally just submitted our med school applications yesterday and then yeah. we've been on this like grind constantly for undergrad. And um, it, it's hard because you kind of lose sight. And um, I think w- the one way we found out of this is similar to the, to the way you saw. We c- kind of started an organization to help the homeless out here in Toronto. And um, we, we learned that through helping these people, we were getting happier. And that, that's why everything you said just resonated so much with us. Yeah, totally, man. It's, it's, it's that service mindset. It's what can I do for the people around me? And that allows you to grow. That allows you to focus on what's important. All this other crap that goes along with school is so unimportant. And then you get to what is really your purpose in life. And I strongly feel everyone's purpose out there is to help others. And that's the only way that you'll actually feel fulfillment in what you're doing, whether you're a student or whether you're a professional. If you switch that mindset to how am I going to help the people around me, man, every day is a great day. It doesn't matter if you have tests. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, a next scary patient or you have a bad case. How am I going to help them from a genuine point of view? And uh, that, that's my, that's my 10 cent advice for you guys. If you can take it or leave it, but uh, it's worked out well for me. I mean, definitely like that's uh, very inspirational. And I know that um, I know that we all struggle with uh, sort of how, where, where is the next step? Where is the next step in our lives? Where are we going? Right. And I guess if we, if we had that change in mindset, I think everything becomes a lot more clear, like you said. So I guess another thing that I want to talk about was uh, your, um, your experience in a country such as Nicaragua and how you volunteered for dental brigades all across the world. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I grew up and I didn't have the ability to travel. Like I, uh, um, whatever the case is, I, I just, I never got to travel. And so I honestly, I wanted an adventure. I'd hear these stories of these Um, you know, dentists going down the Amazon and stopping at Riverside villages and helping them with their dental work. And I'm like, man, that is the coolest thing ever. But I was still like, I was a a dental student at the time listening to those stories. I'm like, man, that would be so cool. But like, it totally changed my whole life. I went out looking for an adventure, but I came back with purpose. And man, I get goosebumps just listening to that, like just feeling that feeling I had back then. It's literally looking someone in their eyes you can't even speak their language but you're able to make that connection and you're there to help them someone who's never had the ability to see a dentist who's who has you know multiple infected teeth and swelling in their mouth and think of the amount of pain that they've been been through and i was here lucky enough in canada to go to school get an education just so i could be in that one place in guatemala to help that person out. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, I can't even explain it, man. It's, it's just this feeling you get of wanting to do more and, and finding your purpose in helping others. Definitely. Yeah. I think, um, I can't say I had a similar experience, but, um, there was, uh, so we all volunteer at the hospital and, um, other places like this. Uh, I, I think I was in grade 10 and, um, uh, a couple came up to me and, um, I think they had some sort of problem, but I was just at the, at, at a desk 
Like my job was literally to direct people somewhere. My job wasn't to talk to them. And they strictly told us not to talk to patients. But what I did was they came up to me and um, they didn't speak English. And they came up to me and then they, they kept showing me their arm. And there was nothing on the arm. They just pointed at the arm. And all I said was, so the, what from what they were speaking, I thought it was Armenian. So I just pulled out my phone, went to Google Translate, tried my best to uh, to to give them give them a visual, and they understood. And I took them to the place. And I I think that day when I went home, I I sort of cried because I was so happy. And since then, I've been volunteering at the hospital because it's just a very nice um, feeling that you get of helping people. Um, like the connection that you talk about, it's 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 sort of the same connection where you, you, they don't really know, um, you know, what what your purpose is. They don't really know what you're doing, but you're still helping them. So I think I think that was a very nice experience um, for us. And the other side of this is you talked about traveling, uh, being a dental student, and also traveling at the same time. I think we had a conversation about this today. That Nimit went on a trip to Portland, and he's like, hey, you know. We should go live in Portland. Once we become doctors, we should all go live in Portland. And I'm like, you know, we live in Toronto. It's a it's a very fast paced city. Moving to somewhere somewhere like Portland or maybe Vancouver even um, would be such a different experience. But I think we still need to travel a lot, experience a lot, and then we'll decide where to settle. But, oh, totally. I, I hear that, man. You you're you got so much time to prepare for those type of things, yeah. but no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's all about, you know, getting the experience that, uh, that you want to get out of dental school and, and, you know, finding those opportunities to do cool stuff. So no, that's wicked, man. So are you, uh, were, were you always based in Alberta or? Um... Yeah. So I grew up in Calgary. Uh, there's no dental school in Calgary. So, um, I applied to, uh, UBC, U of A and U of S and Boston, because I'm like, well, you know, it's you, everyone needs a backup, right? And so I got into uh, everyone except U of A, because uh, my DAT score, we have to, uh, I don't know if you still have to do it now, but you have to carve a soap. Have you guys heard of that? Carve a piece of oh. soap for the dental exam. And uh, they give you like these angles and you have to like carve it out of soap. Maybe I'm aging myself. I don't know. Um, but I didn't do well in that part. And so I couldn't get into U of A, which was in Edmonton. And so it was either Saskatoon, Vancouver, or Boston. And um, I decided to go to Saskatoon because of the amount of clinical experience that um, I heard that you get there. And I'm so grateful that I did because, you know, it led me to where I am today. And that's kind of one of those things, like I needed to explain it to you guys because sitting in your shoes, I know you just applied to med school everyone wants that quick gratification. Like, you know, you apply to med school. I want an email tomorrow getting an interview and then an email the next day saying that I got accepted just so I can feel validated inside that all my years of hard work were worth something. And I know you guys are thinking the exact same thing right now too. But what I tell myself and what I wish I told myself back then, and I still tell myself this every day is every day is a journey. And how crappy would it be if we got everything that we wanted immediately, like life is a journey. You have to work for, for what you want and you have to fail over and over and over again, because when you finally get to where you want to be, it's just so much sweeter. And so I'm, I'm really, you know, I was so frustrated sitting in your shoes as well, like not knowing what, where my destiny or where my life is going to take me, but just remember it's a journey and, and you have to almost, sit back and be like, okay, I'm on this journey. Where is life going to take me? Because everything is going to happen for a reason. Everything is put in front of you for a reason. And when things don't work out, that's what you have to fall back on is, you know, what can I find in this failure or what can I find in this outcome that I can grow from? And so that's, that's how you make sure you don't always have failures, but you always see the positive lining and things. So, yeah. yeah. And that's very good advice for us because we've seen this over and over again with um, so many experiences that we've had where like we failed a little and then we got disappointed and then it takes a few days to get over it. But I, but I see that the optimism kind of gets to you finally. And because of that, you can maintain that level-headed um, like temperament kind of to stay on that, on that level where whether you're having success or failure. Um, I want to go back a little bit to dental school. You mentioned imposter syndrome. And um, yeah. I want to ask if you were always positive like this, 
and how you got through that feeling and just just I know how hard dental school is so how did you get through it what helped you build that confidence to finally become a dentist um so it actually I would say I'm still not very positive I I'm working on that and uh um, I know, you know, outwardly, I'm, I'm always positive. My patients are always like, Neki, why are you always smiling? Like, how do you always stay so happy in the middle of COVID? I'm just, you know, I'm always smiling and deep down inside I'm crying. And I think that's okay. Cause I I've always been one to look at the glass half full. Why am I not smart enough? Why didn't I get a 95? What, like, where, where am I going wrong? Why doesn't this person like me? What did I say to this person to make them upset with me? And, um, you know, it's something that I'm working on, but it shifted a couple of years ago in dental school. I found it very difficult, like really, really hard. I remember sitting in the, uh, you know, the, you know, their version of the guidance counselor, like our student services person in first year, looking at my schedule in dental school, I think we had like 11 classes in our first semester. And I remember studying for anatomy and I didn't take any anatomy in undergrad. And I just broke down in front of her, just crying and being like, man, what am I going to do when I fail out of here? And she's just like, man, just take a breath. Everything's going to be okay. And, and like, she's right. You just have to take everything one day at a time and, you know, try to see, you know, the positive light and everything. But I didn't start to get positive until, you know, I'd say three or four years ago when I finally understood like this, like I have to help the people around me if I'm going to you know, become positive. And that's how I get positive. So I, I, it's something that we still, I still struggle with every day is trying to find the positive outcome in this failure and trying to tell myself that, you know, even though this situation really sucked, I learned from it and I'm not going to make that decision again or, or not make that mistake again. I definitely understand what you're saying. Like, um, I know that uh, in the past few years, you know, I've like, I guess the most relatable thing as a student is not doing well in an exam, um, especially since uh, COVID hit, you know, exams have gone quite a lot harder. Uh, it's just a lot, a lot of hard work to do stuff online, do everything online, have your entire life just through a screen. So um, there's just so many problems with that. And, uh, you know, even my friends have come up to me and just be like, you know, how, how can I get like, through this? And I'm like, I don't know, right? Like, we're all going through the same, the same stuff. So it's just, it's just really hard to cope with it. But I, I do see that um, you just kind of have to tough through it and just be resilient. And I guess that's, that's also what you're trying to get at as well. Oh, and, totally. Uh, and, and it really comes down to like hard work. Because man, I'm not the smartest guy by far. Like, I... I feel like I should be at the bottom of my class, but I wasn't because I'm willing to work harder than anyone else out there. And I think that's the mentality we all need to have. Like we, we may not, I don't know, I don't know you guys, you guys look very, like very intelligent people, but I was not. <laughs> and so I was just willing to work harder than everyone else in the room. And that's kind of what got me through that. And whenever I would feel like, you know, I didn't do well in any exam or something i just be like okay Neki, let, let's time it's, it's, let's go time and you you know play the rocky music in the back of your head or now i know you guys are all listening to drake and you're like man how are we going to do this pump yourself up and study study till 4 a.m every night that was that was my mentality i know it's not the smartest but <laughs> that got me to where i am well i mean honestly i guess uh, each each uh, method has its merits you know um people always like oh, my dad is always telling me like work smart not work hard but they're all they're definitely areas <laughs> i agree with him <laughs> i'm not the <laughs> smartest see <laughs> but I, honestly i do see that there are spots where like working smart isn't the best option like i, I feel like um in dental school or in like uh, medical school in general it, it'd be uh th there is a component of like working hard you you can't get through it if you're not working hard at least that's what i've seen with uh, the students that i've talked to uh, but I guess uh, moving on to my next question, it was just, um, what do you think is the most important quality for any health professional to have? Um, that's actually a really good question. I was, I've, uh, um, I've, I've heard this question before and I've never had, you know, a good answer for it because everything is just so cliche. It's like, oh, they should be empathetic or they should be you know, considerate or, or like willing to listen, but really it, it just comes down to a mixture of, of so many different attributes. 
And for me, I don't know if there's an actual like, you know, physical word that is associated with this, but I feel like what has progressed me to have been able to work with so many anxious patients and, you know, people around the world is, is being able to connect with people and just putting your hand on their shoulder and looking in their eyes and being like, listen, I'm here to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you to the best that I can. And am I like, am I, you know, God that I can, you know, snap my fingers and, and, you know, heal you or, or, or make something work for you? No, of course not. But all we can do is do our best. And so um, that's kind of how I approach all the situations with my patients and, you know, going to the dentist, everyone hates it. But if I can connect with patients and tell them like, you know, I know this sucks, but if we can get through this together and if I can help you, um, we can make it a much better experience. And that's what's really worked for me. And that's how I wish, you know, my doctor treated me. And it just goes back to the golden rule, like treat everyone how you want to be treated. So if you're, you know, deathly scared of, of a procedure or, or something, if you can have that care provider connect with you and tell you that they're going to help you through this, I don't think there's anything more you can ask for. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, I, I think that also ties in with um, the the intentions or or what what the health professional actually wants to get out of their job. And I think we've thought about this a lot because I think this is our next step into our medical journey, which is uh, the CASPER exam. I'm not sure if you've heard about the CASPER exam. No, tell um, me everything. But basically, I think you have to take it if you're going into the health profession, um, nurses, doctors, dentists, and uh, I think most of the medical stream has to take the CASPER exam. It's an ethics exam. You're given a scenario, for example, you know, uh, someone comes in and, um, you know, they, they want to steal bread or something. Would you let them steal bread if they want to feed their family? And, you know, it's, it's sort of that scenario where both the answers could be right. It's how you explain it. And um, I've, well, from what I've heard, it's about, I think, four or five people mark your exam and it's, it's an exam, right? So it's going to be like that. But I wanted to get your opinion on what you actually think about ethics and how important ethics is in um, any kind of medical profession. Because uh, from, from this, the story behind this exam is they want to see what you want, actually want to do after you become a doctor, or would you actually make a good doctor? Yeah, so, I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. But like ethics, whether you're a doctor or a mechanic or a plumber or a radiologist, it's the exact same principle that, that we have to lead our lives with. And so I understand why this Casper exam exists, but man, everything that we do is, is humans is based on ethics. So, you know, I agree that we need to look at these things. I don't know if an exam is the best way to show it, but I don't know what else that they can do to, to show that. But I remember I was doing like, after I was a dentist, I'd go back to the dental school and do interviews um, for the incoming dental or yeah, the incoming dental students. And, you know, it's funny because you see yourself in these applicants, you know, seven years later, you see them and they're sweating and you're at, asking that it's pretty funny. You asked that question or you came up with that question. Cause that's the exact same question I was told to ask. And I had 10 people and I had to rank everyone one to 10 based on their answer. And you're absolutely right. Like you can't really answer those questions well with, you know, four people sitting in front of you. And it's just like a snap question. Um, but really all you can do is, is show your heart and, and show each side of the question. Be like, listen, I, I know you have to steal bread for this. These are the ramifications. If I do steal bread, I know my family's hungry. What other solutions can I come up with? What about the shopkeeper? What about, you know, my family and, and you approach it from all different aspects. Cause I think as you know, medical professionals, if we can look at five different ways around a question or to come up with five different answers, that's all we can do is it's thinking outside the box. It's, you know, wanting to understand who benefits and, and who hurts from every single scenario, basically, right? So uh, those are tough questions to ask, but I understand why they need to be done for sure. <laughs> I think the way you answered that question, though, was like the model way to answer it. 
because that's what they say every single time where we have to look at all the perspectives and then try to try to advocate for one cause but you it's more of an if then rather than just one answer yeah i would really hesitate to give an answer in those scenarios i would i would be talking a lot about all the different aspects of of you know the the consequences of the answer but uh yeah no there's there's no way around that i those are tough questions guys yeah. those are really hard <laughs> and, um, since you have been through dental school and now you've been a dentist for some time um since you did those interviews already i i wanted to ask you what what were you looking for in terms of those people who are interviewing for dental school and what would your ideal candidate be? That's a, that's a really good question because I really didn't like the questions um, that, you know, I was told to ask and, you know, we have to rank the, the candidates. We listen to the same answer 10 times and then you rank the person. Right. And I didn't think that was really fair because you can't get a good sense of, of a person in an interview situation, you literally meet the person once and you have 10 minutes to make your initial judgment on them. And that's really what it is. It's initial impressions. It's not really listening to their answers. And so what I'm looking for is, you know, basic communication skills. I wasn't too interested in the answer, but you have to be able to communicate with patients and with colleagues. And unfortunately in both medicine and especially dentistry, I don't think those communication skills are present at all. Um, I'll call a dentist and they will never even call me back. Like things like that just, just drive me bonkers. Like we're all in the same profession together. We're supposed to be working together, but yet, you know, no, no one's willing to reciprocate a simple act of, Hey, call me back. Let's have a conversation. And so what I'm looking for in there is in those interviews, I'm looking for kindness. I'm looking for communication skills. Like, you know, are they able to look me in the eye and talk to me with confidence and clarity? Do I understand what they're saying? And is this someone that I want to work with in the future? Because, you know, you can get a lot of red flags right off the bat. If, you know, they, they look at, they're always looking at their shoes. They're, you know, they shake your hand, but it's like, you know, a limp handshake. It's just like the initial impressions of like, you know what, show, show you deserve to be here, be here with confidence, be here and speak with clarity and, and show us that you can communicate well, because everything is going to come down to communication at the end of the day. I I see that. It's funny that you mentioned uh, that you don't like the questions being asked. So I was actually wondering, um, to better gauge those skills that you mentioned, communication, kindness, professionalism in general, how would you change the assessment? How would you think about assessment? Now, I know it's a, it's a little bit of a d- tough question to answer, but I'm just curious as to what, what your thoughts on on that. Yeah, that's a million dollar question right there, because I don't think that any, you know, dental school or medical school has has nailed it. And, and they'll be the first ones to agree that they haven't nailed the correct style of questioning. And that's why these, cha- these questions change every year. Um, should they go an ethic based route? Should they go, you know, a situational based route? I remember when I was going through dental school, they asked me questions like, give me a time in your life when you had to show leadership. And I actually didn't mind having those type of questions versus, you know, situational questions. What would you do if someone stole bread? You know what I mean? Because then you can actually give a portion of your history. You can talk to the person about something that you're passionate about. And I prefer to learn more about the candidate through those type of questions, like the give me a time uh, type questions versus almost these pre-rehearsed you know, ethics scenarios that you know you're going to get into because once you learn how to answer an ethics question, it's just the same formula over and over again, right? But if you can tell us like, man, tell me a time in your life that you let someone down. I loved hearing those questions because it shows, you know, yeah, I know where I made a mistake. I'm admitting to my mistake, which is so important. If we all make an error, we have to be the first ones to admit we made an error and how we grew from it. Those are the type of questions I would want to hear. And that gives us a, like, if I was on a panel of interviewers, it gives us a a great view of your whole character. And so that's, that's what I like. And I think those are also, that also gives the person a chance to uh, give some broad answers. I think they're going to walk in in front of four people and you're already, you're already sweating and you don't know what to say. And if they give you a very specific question, I think you'll, you'll get the worst answer out of them. 
even if you're more capable of it. Um, but yeah, um, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about um, all those uh, trips that you've been to and all the people that you've helped. Can you tell us your your best experience and maybe your worst experience out of them? Well, I always share my failures before I share my successes. So let's start with the worst. And I saw it was for my very first trip in Guatemala. Um, I was working in an orphanage. I was a brand new dentist. Uh, I've been practicing for, I don't even know, a couple months. And one of my buddies and I, we went down uh, to uh, Guatemala and we were working in an orphanage and there was a whole bunch of other dentists. And my buddy and I, we were the newbies. We were being told what to do. And so there's this, there's this area called triage and that's where, you know, the lead dentist looks at all the kids and is just like, okay, you need, you know, a filling here, you need a couple of teeth pulled and, and they go down the line and they write down what needs to be done on their bib. And so I was working in the kitchen on a steel table and they would bring kids up on the table. There was a little wooden step stool and they brings them up on the table where they prepared like the corn and, and the tortillas the like a couple hours before for breakfast They're now they're bringing kids on the table and this beautiful young girl comes on the table with her bib and and her name was oh shoot what was her name her name was maria i still remember her name was maria and it said one one x and so i looked at her and one one is our very front tooth and I looked at her and there's a big cavity on her front tooth. And, and like, you're like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm taking out your front tooth. So I go ahead and in my broken Spanish, I'm like, man, you're going to be okay. I freeze her up. Freezing in the front really hurts. There was like a tear rolling down her face already. And I freeze up both sides and I'm kind of make idle chit chat. And then I go to take out the tooth, rotate the tooth out. And I'm so happy for her. She's done. Hey, you're finished. Hey, give a big finito. And then the, I called the translator over and she looks up at me and she says, we're done. I'm like, yeah, we're all done. You're, you're free to go. And she feels around in her mouth and she says, well, when's my next one going to grow in? And I was like, well, that, 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 I, that's, that's, I was stumbling and I'm like, that's, that's your adult tooth. You're not going to get one. And then she looks up at me as her eyes well up in tears and she says how am I going to get married and at that point it broke me because then it really it hit home that every single thing we do has a consequence everything we do as a person and as a dentist and as a professional people trust us to make the right decision for them we're not always going to make the right decision for them and so could I have done anything different in that situation? Maybe I, I shouldn't have pulled the tooth. Of course, I should have talked to the patient more about, you know, you know, this is your front tooth, but I thought I knew better as the dentist to get rid of infection and get rid of, you know, the, the bad tooth, but it's not always that way. And so that is the biggest lesson I've been taught in my entire life is everything has repercussions. And so that's what led me down this road of, of helping others and being like, okay, I made a mistake, but how am I going to grow from it? And how am I going to help the next person? And then one person grew to a thousand people. And then it grew into other projects. Like, you know what? Dentistry is awesome. I can do a lot of, you know, good, but what do these people really need? They need water. So I teamed up with a charity out of Edmonton and um, we started fundraising for water wells and my goal is to give a whole like one community water and i'm like man what if we can get an entire community a water well and that way they won't have to walk to the river several miles away the girls and moms don't have to carry buckets back and forth what if we can get them a water well so i came back home and i'm like man telling all my buddies let's raise some money let's get a water well it's it's 10 grand we can do it whatever and so we drilled that water well and one water well turned to three, turned to five, turned to seven. And now we're at 13 water wells in 13 different communities. And I feel like our ways of helping out are just getting started. And this, this is all from a story about a dentist taking out a front tooth. And it just shows you how things roll down the, the chain and how, like I'm telling you, life is a journey. Everything is going to be set out for a reason. And I'm just living my reason 
And I can't wait to see what's going to happen next year or the year after, or how, I don't know what I'm going to be into. I don't know how I'm going to be helping people, but I'm going to do everything I can in my position to help that way. And I know this is a really long winded answer to why, you know, what's it like to go on a mission trip, but this is what it leads to. And we all just need to get out of our heads and understand that we are on this journey and we just have to like eventually get to where we need to, to help the people around us. Yeah, no, that, that was a very moving story that you told us. Um, we actually heard something similar from one of our other guests that we had on who was also a dentist. And they kind of said that they assumed that um, their patients, uh, like that they knew what was best for their patients and they realized that their patients had just a totally different perspective. And I think it's just so important that you've learned that and that you've acknowledged that because a lot of people wouldn't even acknowledge their mistake. Um, they'd just be like, I'm the dentist, I know what's right type of thing. Um, and, and it's very humble of you to, of, to do that. So I wanted to ask you, like, um, how do you maintain this? Because it's really easy to get distracted um, in terms of to stick with your core values. And um, it's just easy to, to think about other things. So do you practice anything? Do you do any journaling or do you do any meditation? or anything like that, that helps you keep grounded and uh, stay in line with your core values? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I wish I got into journaling more. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't make the time for it where, you know, I, I really think we should. Um, I see a counselor um, and I, I really think a lot of us should. And until I started seeing, um, you know, a counselor or a therapist to help talk out what you're thinking, you know, you really never get that clarity that you're looking for. And I know there's, there's a lot of stigma, especially, especially at your guys' age, like, you know, like, oh no, he's seeing someone to, to talk about his feelings. And so I really think everyone should, because it allows you to get the clarity and get out of your, your head. And so that's kind of what I do to stay grounded is, um, you know, have being accountable to someone else to, you know, help reflect on your actions and why that you're, why you're doing them. And because we're always going to be placed in situations where, you know, something makes us angry and we react negatively to it. But then it's all about sitting back and being like, why did I react negatively to this situation? And it's because they, you know, they, they were trying to take down one of our core values. And until you can reflect and see that and see what's happening almost in slow-mo while it's happening and having that like mindfulness and recognition of what's going on, um, until you get to that point, you're always going to be, um, you know, questioned on your, you know, core values. And, and you're always going to end up in situations that you don't want to be in and you're going to react negatively to them. So to answer your question, I really found what really helped me is talking to someone else about it and not a family member. It's someone that you can literally tell everything to without fear of, you know, uh, repercussion or um, uh, negative feedback, right? Yeah, honestly, I do agree with your with your point. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, us youth. I mean, although there are so many resources available to us, we kind of find that you know it's it's kind of hard to talk to someone. We kind of feel like I, I don't want to make the effort. I feel like what what if my what if my thoughts aren't validated? What if my thoughts are wrong? Right? And I guess that shouldn't be our question. Uh, it, it should it should be what you're saying. It should be how can I stay grounded? How can I stay how can I be in a better place? And uh, I guess that brings us to the end of our of our podcast. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Jamal, for uh, coming on today and speaking about so many inspirational things and uh, how you grew from a dental student uh, to the person you are today. So thank you so much for coming on. Man, thanks, guys. I just want to leave you with one thing. Just one thing. Just remember, all you guys, like you, you three dudes, okay, just remember that behind each and every one of you, there's people that are silently rooting for you, okay? I know it seems hard at this stage, man, I've been there, but you have such a huge support of people behind you willing to lift you up and you're not in this alone. I know it's tough, but you guys will, will break through. You guys will get to you know the next step and just remember it's just a journey. So take it all one, one step at a time, fellas.